They stretch. No, 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 no. You haven't let me uh, finish over there. Two men in a booth from the Muppets. Uh, by the end of the service, you will see it's much crowd. More, more people are here. That's what I mean by uh, stragglers. Uh, anyways, uh, welcome. I'm so glad uh, some of you uh, are here from the EA are here with us this morning. Um, and uh, looking forward to hearing Tom Hendershot speak. Um, some uh, housekeeping things for our congregation. Oh. We are doing uh, Samaritan Operation Christmas Child. If you didn't uh, pick up your boxes uh, to fill, there are unfolded ones in the narthex on either side. Please take one up. Uh, pick one up on your way out. Friday, 10 a.m. is Four Corner Circle. Uh, Four Corner Circle is the women that do the quilts uh, for all our visitors this morning. Um, and um, Saturday is from 4 to 6 p.m. If you have kids or kid at heart, come on down for our trunk or treat. It's from 4 to 6 p.m. on Saturday. Um, and I think that is all our announcements for this week. Oh, Saturday, 7.30 in the morning, men's breakfast. Uh, please come out. We have such a great time with one another. So as we prepare our hearts for worship, let us hear the words from Paul to Galatians. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So welcome again, and um, I'm going to call the worship band forward. And if you experience the worship uh, through the EA Convocation, uh, you're not going to want to stand for this. I mean, sit for this. You're going to want to stand. <laughs> Maybe too tired. There you go. <laughs>
join me in this morning's call to worship, we read this responsibly. Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. In him we were also chosen in order that we who are the first who put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. So let's continue praising the Lord with our next song, Who You Say.
Again, good morning and welcome. It's nice to see you all this morning. And uh, welcome to those who have been on the EA uh, convocation this weekend. It's a blessing to have you with us here at First Church in our worship this morning. We had a full house at 9 o'clock. We had a wonderful uh, worship today. And it's not the numbers. It's our hearts, right? And then we give our hearts unto God and give him praise and glory and worship him and him alone. And so as we do that, let us come together in prayer. Gracious and almighty God, you are the creator and sustainer of all things. We have come before you today from different places, different churches, different backgrounds. But we are united in you. United as one family, one body, brought together by your spirit and your love. Lord, we hold in common the knowledge that your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, died upon the cross to redeem us and reconcile us to you. We are in awe of that kind of love, a love that would sacrifice so much for each one of us. And Lord, we know there is nothing we can do to ever repay the debt that you paid for us. Today we praise your holy name and offer ourselves to you in humble submission to your will and to your way in our lives. Lord, as we come, we ask that you would help us discern your voice over all the others that seek to lead us astray. And in the name of Jesus Christ, we reject the allure of the world, we renounce the lies of the evil one, and we reject the temptations of our flesh. Lord, fill us with your spirit and open our ears so that it may be your voice and your voice alone that we listen to and obey. Open our eyes that we may see where you are at work, in and around us, so that we may join you in that work. And so, Lord, bring hope to the hopeless, freedom to the captive, and healing to the brokenhearted. Lord, we are your church called to be a witness in this world to the love and grace of that you have offered us. Help us to be bold in our actions and in our speech as we bring the gospel into the world. Give us the courage we need to step out from behind walls and to love our neighbor as you have loved us. May those in our communities see you in our actions and in our words. Let your light shine before them that they may be drawn to you your son Jesus taught us a prayer that has echoed down the centuries, a prayer that has given your church strength, hope, and assurance as we face this world. And so, Lord, we ask that you would hear us now fresh and anew from our hearts as we join in the prayer saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'd like to ask if Pastor Jonathan would come forward and share with us our first kid's story today. Yeah, I'm going to sit down. <laughs> good morning. It's good to see you all. Uh, normally, our kids will exit afterwards and, and have Sunday school, and because we didn't have adult study today, they probably didn't think we were having kids study today. But... Uh, we're called to come as children to Christ anyway. So we have been studying in uh, our Bible adventures. We have been studying all about numbers that we see in the Bible. And so we've been, we've been talking about the Ten Commandments and seven days of creation. And we come to another ten. What? There's another ten, Pastor Jonathan? Yeah, there's lots of tens. And there is... I was trying to think of an illustration that would go with this text, and I could only think of something when I was growing up, and I used to wear a lot of turtlenecks. 
And um, as a little kid, you know, you're anxious, you get home and you're ready to pull it off and you pull it. Mom! Your head's stuck in the turtleneck. And so you go, well, that's the problem. And so you, I go to my mom and she works it off, you know. And then I just grab my sweater and go away. What's the one thing I didn't do? Thank her, right. In, in the Bible, there's a story of Jesus, and, and he's walking between Galilee and Samaria, and he's coming through a village, and there are ten guys with leprosy. And they see him, and they say, Master, Jesus, we want to be healed. And Jesus says, go and show yourselves to the religious leaders. And so they start heading off down the track, and one of them sees that, oh my goodness, I'm healed already. I didn't have to dip myself, I didn't have to rub mud. And, and he is the one, he realizes that, and he goes back to Jesus. And he falls on his face and he says, thank you, Jesus. And Jesus says, weren't there 10 of you? I, I mean, I, I, I counted 10. But only one, a foreigner, comes back and gives me thanks? Hmm. That got me thinking about us and our lives and, and our relationship to God. And are we the one to go back to say thank you from 10 to 1? Not like me and pulling my pulling my turtleneck over my head and getting stuck and not saying thank you to my mom, we ought to remember that through the struggles of life, through the healing we received, through the supper that we take, the communion of saying thank you for what he has already done for us. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word because it reminds us that our character needs to be molded and shaped by you. Not by the world, but by you. And so we right now, in our hearts and in our minds, say thank you, Lord, for what you have done for me. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Jonathan, for your words this morning of always giving thanks. You know, oftentimes we hold our thanks to the point when we get something good. Right? You know, we say, okay, God, this is what I want, and he delivers, and we go, yes, thank you, Lord. But what about those moments he doesn't, we don't get what we want? Do we still thank God for God, for who he is, what else he is doing in our lives? You know, it's hard to wake up on a on a Monday morning and it's dreary and raining and you, you know, you like, oh, wow, look at the weather outside. Those bright sunny days we get up and we look outside, thank you, Lord, for this day. But on the rainy days, giving God thanks for he's given us another day and we're to worship and to walk in his will and way. So always give thanks for him. God has proven faithful time and time again. He has answered prayers. He has healed. He has encouraged us and strengthened us. He has blessed us as churches, as his children. And so we go to him time and time again in prayer. And so we're going to bring our petitions and praises to him now. So would you bow your heads with me as we do so? Gracious and loving Father, we have gathered today as your people, the body of Christ. We've come to worship, we've come to fellowship, and Lord, we've come to pray. Lord, oftentimes we search in places we should not. We look to the world, we look to others rather than turning to you. So we ask you, forgive us. Forgive us for seeking, not seeking your face first. And with our heads humbly bowed, Lord, we we give you our hearts, our hearts that break under the heavy loads of each day, 
of the broken lives. And so we come seeking your healing. For you, Lord, have known our sorrow, our pains, and our struggles. And we come for healing, restoration, and the hope only you can offer. We thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you that you are there as our unchanging and merciful God that never leaves us or forsakes us. And so, Lord, in that assurance, we come before you in this moment of silent prayer, offering up the deepest concerns of our hearts. Lord, we thank you that you have heard these prayers that came from our hearts. And we join, Lord, as your church to raise up the prayers of uh, those we know, friends and family, and those we don't even know yet, Lord, bringing them before you and asking you to bring healing where healing is needed, comfort where comfort is needed. And Lord, we, we begin by praising you for the healings we have witnessed. We thank you that Emil and Gail are doing much better we pray you continue to give them strength as they recover from the virus. We pray, Lord, that, uh, that you have, and thank you for the opportunities you have given us to pray for others and witness out in our communities. We thank you, Lord, that Adelaide has been able to get a computer and that our fellowship out in Uganda has been able to purchase a new sound system for that fellowship. We thank you that the growth is happening, Lord, there, Lord, that would need a sound system. Thank you for that witness of your work in that area. Lord, we praise you for this weekend and the EA convocation and all those that came to fellowship and to, to uh, spend time together to learn Lord, what a blessing it has been. And Lord, I pray your hedge of protection to be about each one as they head back to their own churches and bring back what they have learned and may uh, this convocation and what has happened here spread amongst the churches. And Lord, we lift up the prayers of those who are having continuing needs in our congregation. You know their needs and their names and we bring them before you and lay them at your altar. We pray, Lord, for Dan and Kathleen and the cancer treatments they were going through and that you would provide for them and encourage their hearts and strengthen them. We also pray for Kathleen Moe and Andrew Moe. Pray for Kathleen and the many health issues she has and for Andrew as he goes through the uh, thyroid eye uh, treatments that he is having. Lord, we have lost a number of people in this past week. Uh, for we so we pray your peace, your comfort, and your strength for uh, Sandy Miller and her family at the passing of her brother-in-law David. We pray for Michael and John and her family at the passing of her father. And we pray for Christine Monaco and her family at the passing of her uncle. And we lift before you Eric in Uganda at the passing of his grandfather. Lord, we pray that you would walk with them in this time of grief, that they would turn to you and find that peace that passes understanding. Lord, we pray for Eduardo as he, in his upcoming uh, surgery uh, on his pancreas, for Joe Tedeschi healing and recovery from cancer surgery, for Danny, Sherry's niece's son, in the hospital with bronchitis and pneumonia. We praise you, Lord, that Cindy Olbrey's friend's new granddaughter, who was the in NICU, is now home. We lift before you, Lord, the needs of your churches across the, the nation, that we would truly, Lord, be that lights, the lights upon hills, that we would truly bring your gospel message into those communities. Give us wisdom as we do so. We pray for our children and your, their protection and welfare. And we thank you, Lord, 
that you are there for us each and every moment. And we give you praise and thanks in Christ's holy and precious name. Amen. We will now receive our morning tithes and offerings uh, as uh, Deacon Claudia brings those and uh, places them there at the uh, piano. Um, if you uh, were thinking of bringing an offering this morning to the church, uh, you're welcome to deposit your offering after church uh, in that uh, church, our mini church. <laughs> And uh, so let's give thanks to God now for the many ways he has blessed us and provided for us. Gracious God, thank you. Uh, it doesn't seem to be enough. Uh, we could say thank you from here <laughs> to the end of our lives and for eternity, and it wouldn't be enough. But Lord, in seeking to honor your word, in seeking to be the good stewards of all that you have blessed us with, we have brought our gifts, our tithes, and offerings before you. We pray, Lord, that they truly reflect our gratitude, truly reflect the thanksgiving that we have in our hearts for all you have done and are doing. And we pray, Lord, that you would consecrate them for their holy use, that they would be used for the furtherance of your kingdom, and that more and more people would come to know you as Lord and Savior. We pray this in Christ's holy name. Amen. So our scripture this morning is from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. This is the scripture that the convocation was uh, centered upon. It has been something that we have been praying over and through uh, for the last two and a half years as we've prepared for this and gotten ready for it. And God, I believe, has honored that has been a wonderful time together. And so uh, hear these words uh, from Peter. He writes, As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone and a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a holy priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. May the Lord bless the reading and hearing of his holy word. We have a guest preacher with us today. His name is... Tom Hendershot. Tom, Tom comes us to us from Jerusalem, where he's currently the pastor of Jerusalem Church in New Philadelphia, Ohio. Tom is a retired Army Master Sergeant. He served most of his time with the Chaplain Corps there. He was raised out there in Southeast Ohio. 
He committed his life to Christ at an early age. He's been married to his wife, Angie. Angie's back there up by the, in the loft there. Uh, they've been married since 1983. They have four children and a growing number of grandchildren. He's preached for over 40 years around the world in various settings across different denominational lines. And he's come to us today as uh, the... Uh, Vice President of the National Board of Directors of the Evangelical Association and soon to be the President of that association. Uh, well, the Association Board. I don't know if you're President of the whole thing, but you take it where you want. <laughs> so, uh, Pastor Tom, if you come forward with your words. Well, you heard him say, I can take that where I want, right? Yeah. So we'll go with that. Uh, I tended to travel a little bit this morning and got too far away from the microphone, so I'm going to hold this one uh, today. That way, as I go on my strolls, I'll be all right. Am I okay back here? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, it is my delight to uh, speak to you today uh, from the same passage that we've looked at uh, for the entire weekend as a convocation and uh, try to draw an idea there that spoke to me as I, I uh, looked at this passage, I want to talk to you about Christian identity. Christian identity. I think we live in a world today where there's a lot of identity confusion. And for... Uh, people of Christ, the body of Christ, uh, we need to understand some things about our identity, and I think it's helpful for us. And this particular passage helps us in that regard. You know, they say you should be careful how you end any sentence that you start with, I am. Some people run around and say, I'm a loser. Well, the experts say we should never define ourselves by our weaknesses. Others will come along and say, I'm the pitcher for the Houston Astros, who will probably win the, oh, never mind. <laughs> Did I go off into heresy or something? Okay. I'm the pitcher for the Boston Red Sox, who will probably win. Who am I if I can no longer pitch? So my identity can't rest in my weaknesses, it shouldn't, and it can't rest in my accomplishments. My identity has to be grounded and founded and rest in something deeper than that. And this passage in 1 Peter chapter 2 for the believer helps us establish and uh, become grounded in what our identity is. In the West, self-definition typically begins with the I statements. In other places of the world, it's the we statement. We. Uh, in some places of the world, it's all about who your father is. And we see all of this in the Bible, really. Jesus was called Jesus, the son of Joseph. Jesus, by trade, the carpenter's son. Jesus of Nazareth, where he, uh, his location, uh, where he came from. We also find Peter's called Peter, the son of Jonah. So all of that is, as far as natural identity, is there. But... Peter is talking about something a little deeper than our natural identity in this particular passage. He's talking about our spiritual identity. For Peter, in this letter, identity begins with such questions as, Who is my God? Whom do I trust? What is my community? The question, whose am I, has more weight than who am I? I think for those who were a part of the um, gathering this weekend of the association, uh, it has helped us in this time of 
confusion to center in more and embrace our identity as an association. Because, you know, I was raised with this little saying, and I think it's pretty helpful. You either stand for something or you fall for anything. And I, I think this is the day and age where we need to uh, come to terms with what it is that we believe and what it is that we stand for and who it is that we stand for. And that identity of whose we are is what helps us in that regard. For Peter, in this particular passage, we find that our faith in Christ is what defines us. Because Jesus is God's foundation stone, we are living stones. Because he chose us, we are God's chosen people. That sounds like a, 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 a heady thing to say, but we read it in the text. You are God's chosen people. Once you were not a people. Identity. But now, Peter says, you are the people of God. That's identity. That is identity. The Bible is a book of identity. We find it in the first pages of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's identity. If you are a part of this planet or a part of this solar system or a part of whatever's beyond all of that, this universe, you have the same identity. The first cause of everything is God. So naturally, our identity is in God the Creator. But we also know that the rest of the, the story continued from Genesis 1. And a couple chapters later, we're in Genesis 3, and we find another part of our identity as human beings. Adam and Eve in the garden created an, an, an innocent obedience, moved over to a place of willful disobedience, and embraced a new identity as part of a fallen universe, a fallen planet, a fallen race. And every person who's ever been born of Adam and Eve has that moral identity as part of a fallen race. So we know naturally we're part of God's creation. We know morally we're part of a fallen race. But that's not the end of the story. Look at somebody beside you and say, I'm glad that's not the end of the story. <laughs> Peter said, God in his mercy, when you were not a people, God in his mercy sent his son. And he redeemed us. He, re he redeemed us. He gave us new purpose for life. He gave us significance. He gave us security. And he gave us a new identity in Jesus Christ. So, for Peter, the question is not so much who am I, but whose am I? And that's the question that is relative and, and matters for each and every one of us today. That identity. We know that as time went on, humanity slipped further and further away from God. Paul talked about it in Romans chapter 1. I'll read a couple of verses from there. He said, For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. And he goes on to say that they, they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever blessed. Amen. Paul is saying they lost their identity as people who were made in the image of God. And, and this devolved lower and lower and further and further away from God. And when they lost their identity as created by God in the image of God, they lost their meaning for life. 
And that's why we come up with all the crazy and the bizarre things that we see in our world today. It's because we have lost our, our, our purpose as human beings created by God. We've lost that stamp of God's image. We no longer can look in the mirror and see ourselves as God's creation. We see our own fallen humanity and then we drift further and further away from God's design. But Peter says, as you come to him, the living stone, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So according to Peter, all that we are rests on all that Jesus is. If we come to Christ, the living stone, we become living stones. Jesus is the cornerstone and God builds us into a spiritual house that rests on him. Because Jesus is God's chosen one, we are now God's chosen ones. So becoming one with Christ, coming to Christ changes our identity. Seeing Jesus rightly causes us to see ourselves as God intended for us to be. Peter knew this firsthand. Anybody remember his story as told in, in Matthew 16? Jesus, they, they came through the shores of Caesarea Philippi, and Jesus asked them, Who do men say that I am? And they gave him all the latest reports. CNN says he's Jeremiah. Come back from the dead. MSNBC says he's Elijah or one of the other prophets. All of them had it wrong. Peter said, you, Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? And it always comes down to that. It must always come down to that. Regardless of what anyone else is saying, who do you say I am? Peter says, you are the Christ the son of the living God. And Jesus immediately says to him, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven, and you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You see, it was when Peter recognized the identity of Jesus that Jesus uncovered his identity to him. It wasn't enough to label Jesus with all the greatest names of their religion. Peter needed to know him by his spirit as his Lord and Savior. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. It wasn't enough to learn about Christ. Peter needed to experience Christ firsthand in his heart, personally. Come to him coming to him. And you know, the same thing is true for each and every one of us today. It's still, it's still the truth. Our identity is discovered in Christ. As the association that we've uh, gathered as over the weekend, our identity can never be based on anything that the fallen culture around us tries to dictate or deems as wise and deems as relevant, claiming themselves to be wise, they become fools. It must be on Christ, the Son of the living God. It must be based on the revelation of the truth of his word and the confirmation of his spirit. You see, he's the living stone. That means a stone that's uncut. 
uncut by human hands. Not a stone that's, that's been taken out of the quarry and cut and shaped and made to fit according to human standards. He's the living stone uncut by human hands. We can't make Jesus into something else. And that happens a lot today. Can I get an amen, anybody? He must be as God has set him as the chief cornerstone. He's the only foundation for this association. And he must be the only foundation for our lives, for our churches, for everything. And I want to say to each of us as individuals, our identity is in Christ. Christ alone. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. See, we are born from a fallen race into a fallen world with a distorted identity. We have a natural and a, and a physical identity, but natural identity alone will not help us find our purpose and our meaning and our significance and our true identity in God. Left to ourselves, we're lost. And we cannot understand who we really are. We instinctively know there's more to the story. I cannot know who I am until I know whose I am. And as we come to Christ, we find our true identity, our spiritual DNA, our true roots, connecting to God before time. See, as believers, we know the rest of the story. We know that natural identity was in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But as believers, we know we were in the heart and the mind of God from eternity even before that natural creation. Predestined, chosen in him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world. Chosen to be built on that living stone. But that's an identity by faith we have to come to terms with before it can ever work out in our lives. In Christ, we become living stones. God builds us into a spiritual house, a house that rests on Christ. We learn that we're chosen by God, chosen ones. We're brought face to face with our true identity according to God's plan. God puts us into a community. A community of the Spirit. A new temple that he's building. And he said that he would build his church on that rock. That applies to us corporately and Individually, all of our identity, our security, and our significance rests on this cornerstone, this rock. That's why people search throughout their entire lives for identity and security and significance. Peter says, as you come to him, the living stone. John said it this way. He came into his own and his own received him not. But as many as received him to them, he gave the power to become the children of God. That is identity. God's child. That's identity. Some people go through their whole lives with a natural identity uh, because of their great genealogy and, and all of this. And they ride on that natural identity. I want to tell you, as a child of God, it doesn't go back in, in the... There's not a more impressive line than that. That's identity. Child of God. 
That's your identity. Security. We are in a a time where uh, finding and feeling a sense of security seems to uh, be very evasive from us. But Jesus said it this way. Whosoever, he, he compared life to a house and that your life is built on a foundation. He said, that whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on a rock. He said, the foolish man built his house on sand. And you notice when he's telling the story, the same things happened to both houses. He said, the winds blew against the house. The rains beat on the house. The storms blew. Has anybody ever noticed that when you give your life to Christ, uh, it doesn't take away all your problems? I mean, some people do advertise Christianity that way, right? You know, just come to Jesus and you'll never have another problem. Uh, I guess I got the wrong message there or something because, in fact, I got a few extra problems I didn't have before. So I really missed out on that one. <laughs> Whew. See, it's not that we don't go through the same things that everybody else goes to. The difference is, is our lives are built on a different foundation. That's security in a world that is searching for security. And that's what you have as a believer, as a child of God, if you embrace that identity, that spiritual DNA. Significance. Paul says it this way, for by grace you've been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast about it. And he says, you are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has preordained for you to do. God already preordained good works for you to do from before time. Talk about a destiny. Talk about significance. That's what you have in Christ. As you come to him, you find identity. You find security. You find significance. As we come to him, we are transformed. As we come to the living stones, you also become living stones. I'm having so much fun, I don't know where to quit. <laughs> as living stones, we're part of the building. As priests of God, we're part of the program. <laughs> And that's what Peter's saying in this text. And, and, and he says that we are to offer spiritual sacrifices. I love this, this part here. Because you think about that. I used to love to study the tabernacle and, and all of that, from the, the Old Testament. And all that they did in the temple and the tabernacle. And, and all the work of the service. And it's all wrapped around dead sacrifices. Anybody notice that? But Paul says to us, we are to present our bodies as living sacrifices. Living sacrifices. In other words, you come to the living stone. He makes you into a living stone. And you begin to live a life with meaning and purpose and significance because you have a new identity. Amen, anybody? Living stones and we offer spiritual sacrifices I suppose my favorite verse for this is in Hebrews 13 verses 15 and 16 it says that we come offering spiritual sacrifices to him that the fruit of our lips did anybody do that today in worship offer to him a living sacrifice of the fruit of your your lips a spiritual sacrifice but so I, I break this down into two different categories your words and your works the things that you say become part of your sacrifice, your spiritual sacrifice in this new priesthood. In this new priest, You realize that you are a priest of God if you're a believer, right? Better look at somebody beside you and say, I think he's talking about you. 
You are a priest of God. And you're offering spiritual sacrifices, your praise to God, your witness, your testimony. These are spiritual sacrifices and they make a difference. Always look for that opportunity. Realize that you are in the priesthood as a believer. That's what Martin Luther said. I mean, we're Protestant. We believe in the priesthood of believers, right? Right? So, so we're all priests of God. Go through your day. I just challenge you to do this. Uh, try it for a week and see if you like it. And it might stick, right? Uh, go through your day looking for where I can uh, serve God by spiritual sacrifice, by something I say or by something I do. He also says in verse 16 there of Hebrews 13 that it's by our good deeds. Don't ever think that your good deeds don't matter. They matter because you're part of this priesthood, of this new temple that God is building through time. Founded and grounded on Christ. The chief cornerstone, you and I also are living stones. So I encourage you, if you were here the whole weekend, I encourage you to take everything that you have received from God this weekend and live it out. Recognize your amazing identity in Christ as a living stone. And let's make a difference in our world. Earlier in this message, I mentioned Peter's thoughts here were along the lines of, who is my God? Whom do I trust? What is my community? I want to remind you of verse 4 as we close this out today. As you Come to him, the living stone. As we come to him, we acknowledge that he is our Lord and our Savior. He's my Lord, John, Jonathan. He's my Lord. He is Christ, the Son of the living God. And I make that confession with, with Peter. I put my trust in him. And this connects me with others of like precious faith. And the community that God is building, the new priesthood called the church, the people of God, the new temple. As we close in prayer today, and as you listen online, perhaps you've never come to him. In this way. Peter said this stone is precious. To those who believe. I encourage you to come to Christ. Open your heart to him. Receive the gift of God. Connect to life himself. The living stone. And I promise you. That you'll never be the same. Never be the same. God bless you. Let's pray. Oh, gracious Father, we come to you through Christ our Lord. We come to you, Jesus, the living stone, the precious one. We thank you, oh God, for, for making us and the living stones in the, the new temple you are building. Help us to, to be the people of God that that you would have us to be. Show us that our identity is in Christ. That you've, you've made us into a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. That we may declare the praises of the one who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. Holy Spirit, Move, we, we plead, on each heart here and each one listening online. And make Jesus more and more precious to us. And to those who've never fully trusted in Christ as their Savior, Lord, we, we ask you to, that you would call them 
into this glorious company of faith now and show each one of us how to live more faithfully for you in this time. In Christ's precious name we pray. Amen.
City for quite a while, taught marketing, and I would travel from here down there. And one day I just <laughs> I had a gloomy day. I got off the train and I'm just walking to my office doing the normal thing. And then I heard a worship team. And I'm still walking with my head down. And then I said, you're a child of God. And I just continue saying that. You're a child of God. You're a child of God. You're a child of God. Got to the crossroad. You're a child of God. You're a child of God. You're a child of God. By the time I got to my office, I was a child of God. Praise God. We need to preach to ourselves the gospel of Jesus Christ that we are. He's going to form us into that rock that he wants us to be because we are children of God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace this day and forevermore. Amen. Let us go in peace.